countries of South Africa and we live uh, most of our time with our family where we can. Um, I would like to just uh, open this with a prayer. If anyone um, is not happy with that, please speak up. Dear God, we thank you for the opportunity to present into the National Health Insurance and the health structures in South Africa for our communities today. We trust that our words will be heard. We trust that all our hearts will be touched. We touch on things that will take us forward into the future from our communities in South Africa. We pray for our country, God, and that we may be protected in Kosi Sikilele, Africa. Amen. Thank you for that opportunity. I'd like to give you a little bit of background on myself and what I'm doing here, addressing um, the room. I have sent out and, and with the agenda, a portfolio of myself and my experience. Um, and just to give you a bit of background to that, I'm here representing the a beatroot.org, an NBO that, NPO that has been set up to assist in community-based planning and impact mitigation on communities. So for those who had the opportunity to look at my brief CV and the sectors of health, I'll just go through it. I've been involved in health of communities from a young person working um, in the Eastern Cape, and I became a hospital architect and through that process, I, we lived in the Eastern Cape and worked with communities there and now on the Western Cape. And our objective is to support community through community programs, engagement with various custodians of the, of the process. And to put on the table today that we are all custodians of this process, that we are working forward towards giving our communities better healthcare and better healthcare access. I have been involved in community planning, this next slide up, and I'd like to just say that we are standing here today on behalf of the people of South Africa and the communities of South Africa. I am and quite an old man now, and I've been uh, engaged since growing up as a as a boy on a farm in KwaZulu-Natal and then working with communities in healthcare and hospital design and planning and architecture and project management of community projects, practically my whole work, working life. So that's the position I'm coming from that we are putting in for planning and care of communities, which is everybody's portfolio today around the table, I think. Um, I am a consultant acting on behalf of the NPO in integrated development planning and, and impact mitigation. And if people have had an opportunity to see the website, uh, one of the connections I have is in planning for community impacts around sectors um, that affect everyday life, our living in community. And I want to just run through a planning system. So if everybody around the table could just think of a way that we do integrated planning. I think most people have heard about integrated development planning and the, the, the planning systems that develop around how we're going to help community, how we're going to help the environment, how we're going to help our health. And the systems that we put together are simple um, systems where we can actually assess the impacts. So what we are doing while we are talking here is we are assessing the impact on our community health. And our perspective going through this is that there's challenges we face. How do we put this together in a system of planning? How do we address community impacts? And then assessing the community impacts, which projects or which initiatives are going to be the the most effective to help community. So the NHI as a initiative um, by the South African um, 
legislation, the South African government, on behalf of communities, then becomes the medical aid for the most of our population. And with that perspective, we look at how does this affect our communities and how can we improve the system going forward, if at all, on providing better health impacts for our communities. So I'm going to just run through a systems approach here on the screen to integrated planning, and I'm talking to it. Um, I am able to share the screen if anyone wants donations later, so I'm happy to do that, and I have a flip chart behind me. But I'm going to go on in the time period I have to the integrated planning and systems approach that we adopt. That we adopt. And this picture here, um, this, this um, presentation is available to everyone I trust. This picture here on the right-hand side, you'll see it forms a flower if we put it together. And that basically is a communication or an impact network. So we look at our biological environment, is, what resource we can get, our health and wellness of our communities and our existence, our social safety and community, education and economy. Just those six areas are our primary areas that we look at when we do this matrix of planning. So if we put health in the middle and we say, OK, what resources do we need to create good health? How does it affect our social environment? How does it affect the education of health? And also very important, the value of the initiatives. So the NHI is an initiative which would have impacts or source its impacts from these six areas. It's quite simple. If you just look at it every time you put an issue in the middle and you ask the questions, how does it affect my biophysical or the biophysical environment? What are the resources needed to do the project? What is the health of the system or the health of the, of the community? What is the social safety and, com and the community aspects that we deal with and all the dynamics of community? And then the education, knowledge and skills that are needed to make those, po those positive impacts. And then the value we get back from it and how we manage it with the project management of these health uh, areas and the social issues, education and our resources fit. So I trust that is clear up to a point as much as we are able to achieve at the moment. The point is, is that we look at these six areas for any initiative that we do. Now, the National Health Insurance Strategy sits squarely in the provision of health to communities. So we look at the provision of health what it's going to be able to achieve, where the community key points are in planning, that one can provide the most benefit to the communities in the most effective way. That provides social stability and safety of community. If you have a source of education and knowledge that provides growth of community in this aspect, it's a very positive value. And then obviously, how much does it save the NHI? What is it going to cost the community? What is it going to cost the NHI? What is it going to cost the country? And then how you roll it out into the biophysical realm. Are there offices there? What are your service providers, like the Department of Health, um, clinical site structure, and then the community structures at that interface? So this systems approach has placed us into a situation of where we impact communities most effectively. And that is in primary healthcare. It's a world initiative. It's a part of the SDGs. It is part of our responsibility um, as citizens and as the people of South Africa to provide where we can support. Somebody has um popped one here sorry
Um, I'm not sure if the screen was available. Um, no, it was not. It wasn't. Okay, I'm coming to, sorry, uh, just to reiterate quickly. Thank you very much. Okay, this is the planning framework I was talking about. There are six basic perspectives that we look at at planning in planning any project or community impact. And that little flower on the right is like a communication network. This is where we assess the data and the information that we come back and we make an impact assessment in these areas. So right at the top, we have community health up here. And these are the six sectors we apply to it. Health and wellness is the responsibility of all of us. But in, in terms of delegated responsibility, the Department of Health, our community structures, and the NHI, which is the insurance and the private sector, all sit in providing the service. And that level of service, the value of that service, impacts on our social uh, living environment, our safety and health and community. We have education. Sorry, Chairperson. Sorry? Sorry, Chair. Chairperson. Sorry, Doctor, we, we can't see anything here. We only see some colored rounds here and there's no weight and uh, no, there's nothing that, that we can see and read and associate with what the presenter is saying. Dr. Dromo, can you intervene, please? Seems like Dr. Dromo has lost his connectivity. Uh, Mr. Yes. Paul, Paul. Yes. What was, oh. I was just tying up my shoelace. I hear Dr. Tembegua speaking. I lost, I didn't follow. Maybe you can assist uh, uh, to say that again, Mam Tembegua. Okay. What I was saying was, Chairperson, uh, the presenter was speaking. Uh, we don't even know what he was speaking on. Okay. Uh, but right now, I can see something. Okay. So whatever he was uh, was was uh, talking on, we did not see. So we couldn't associate that page with colors to what he okay. was saying. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I ask honorable members, what you're talking through must be reflected because we don't have. A, a summary of what we have. Okay. You know we have a document yes. that you sent to Parliament, yes. but here you are summarizing that presentation. As you summarize and talk, show that presentation right. in them. Good. Yeah. Okay. Um, is it on screen now? Can everyone see? Okay. Yes, I'm coming is. back just just briefly. This is a this is the framework of planning that we look at when we find out what the best impacts of projects are how we frame up planning. So I'm going to leave this now and I'm going to move on to the presentation and go through the primary healthcare perspective. The primary NHI objective is to achieve universal access to quality healthcare services in the Republic in accordance with 27 of the constitution. Inter alia equitable, effective and efficient utilization of the resources and strategic purchasing of healthcare services. And then primary health care means addressing the main health problems in the community. Again, addressing main health problems in the community, so providing promotive, preventative, curative, and rehabilitative services. So what we're going through when you get this presentation, which should be emailed to everyone, is that we are looking at how we can assist the NHI to meet the objective of quality health care in the Republic to our communities. So we have some assessment points that I, I raised in my letter to into the NHR process in, December, in November uh, 2019. And these pressure points address a healthcare system where we have in clinical sites on the left, we have the primary healthcare in the community site on the right, and we have assessed the care interface where we need to know the impacts of these current situations, new situations, and new systems that we can look at. So the healthcare system works like this in terms of the NHI's um, objectives, how it provides care, how the referrals work, and where there's a gap analysis. So we've undertaken that gap analysis, and we then go forward, and then we look at what the issues are 
The primary health care system must address crisis in maternal health, gender violence and rights abuse, compounded by the pandemics, climate impacts, food and water scarcity, family safety and security. And the critical role of primary health care for women and children in community as an emergency response to these crises that I've listed above here. So this presentation is around an emergency response that both the national health insurance process and our current health care and health provision structures need to seriously consider where we are. So we do a primary health care impact assessment of what are the challenges, some of the challenges. And I'm, I hope um, I'm able to share this. This is a wound of a female. She has a child. She was sent home from hospital with an infected wound off a gallbladder removal, and she was sent home like that, the staples removed and packing in the wound. This lady had no instruction on how to take her antibiotics or how to clean the wound or any material to clean it. She was taking one antibiotic tablet a day. After a week, the wound infective and the antibiotic regime not able to be implemented. This is what we sit with, with a lady. I just want you to remember that image because these are severe injuries in community that people experience both in the hospital from the hospital that there's difficulty in staffing and and aspects of it that we need to look at and also in community where wounds take place and they need to be healed so we talk about primary health care for communities the primary health care service at levels that provide safer immediate and community on-site options self-care system around natural birthing process for mothers and babies is a high impact area and it's here at the community interface where the community is served best as traditional and support health practitioners work can make a significant impact to and help create a responsive safer healthcare system because the knock-on effects of maternal care which is brought direct into families are very very broad it's not just about mother and baby it's about families and about in crisis situations how people to then turn to those closer to closest to them and assist the communities. So I want to just show a video clip, if I may. Um, sorry. Just want to. I'll be within a second. Here we go. I just want to go to. I'm going to screen share now. Thank you very much. I just want to play this. Yeah. Can you see this and, one? Uh, again, she yes. was my baby. Okay. Yes. The, the, okay. Just my, my <laughs> when, when I feel the, the pain, mm -hmm. I didn't tell me the, 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 the sister there is very strong. It's not talking nicely, but current, there's a difference. Current, if you feel pain, you must go. You must sleep in the make a sponge to sleep 
in the floor mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. if you feel the pain and help you like to rub in your waist like mm-hmm. so in the clinic nothing what do they do then in the clinic then you you must sleep on the on the on the back in the in the clinic then you must push your baby your mm-hmm. when i've got a pain i feel like i i i mean maybe i feel like he, i'm doing some things okay but they didn't want me to do that things whereas i can feel that i can do that and uh on me uh, i tell myself i can protect my baby and i know that i don't make my baby on a risk so that some of the nurses try to to to, to to show that you you can put your baby on a on a bad situation if you are going those those things because they've got no time to looking after you if you want to be down they are not they've got no time to look at you they are going to the offices they are go oh uh, there they if you are alone, and a half minutes. you can get bad even they even if they are not here because there is no care. You have reached your 14 and a half minutes. Hello? Is your, is your video 14 no, and no. a half minutes? No, no, it's finished now. Okay, I'm going to stop screen sharing now. And then I'm going to share, thank you very much. I'm going to share where we are and just discuss that. So that is an example of how feedback from the community challenges um, and perceptions of community are reviewed and dealt with and we get feedback and that feedback forms challenges that we address that we have discussions on and we see methods of improving those challenges and the health systems assessment of primary health care poses these challenges i'm going to Can everyone can everyone see the screen? Is everyone yes, able sir. to? Okay, good. Thank you. So these are the health system challenges we identify. The Department of Health Community Healthcare System, which is a service provider to the national health insurance and to the communities of the of the country. These are clinical support, hospital support challenges that we have anecdotal and written and uh, evidence of challenges that are faced that need to be discussed and then the private health care system which has a, a in south africa the highest cesarean rate in the world and that's driven by um uh, the structured um, uh, colonial medical medicalized system with with insurance impacts on service providers um a pathological approach to child care, obstetric system violence on both areas, and then what do, what are the communities thinking about this, and how do our service providers and the national health insurance address these issues, which become systemic after a long time? There's newspaper articles which can be accessed, uh, many of them, but uh, just on recently this last month. The baby death rate at Kabecha Hospital skyrockets. The staffing crisis is deepened. This is exacerbating the situation. Uh, infant mortality is 43 per thousand births, um, and that is extremely high, um, where the normal is four to five. These are challenges that we perceive that we are able to make a difference if we look at the systems and structure the systems to support communities. The cesarean section rates I mentioned here, unnecessary cesareans, and I, I repeat, unnecessary cesareans for low risk mothers seems to be a pandemic as well that this country faces, particularly for first time birth. So the systems which were providing a, a net of support to communities, not just for for maternal health, but for family health, they seem to have broken down. And we need to address this because this is where we can make the biggest impact 
on our communities. It's all of our responsibility. Um, every single one of us, the mothers amongst us who at the table today who have experienced challenges or those that have communities, rural communities, particularly where you can't get to maternal care, the ambulance doesn't come, and then there's an abuse of the system because people are overworked or they just don't care. These are the issues that were raised in the letter of November 19. And there's just too much to present today and to go through and to interrogate any of this. This is the subject of a separate platform and separate issues where people get around the table and discuss it. But from here, as part of the NPO's strategy, this, by the way, is that wound, that same wound, community intervention of a midwife uh, using both naturopathic and allopathic protocols. She adjusted the antibiotic regime and made sure that the lady was on the proper and, uh, and allopathic protocols. The irrigation solution was rooibos tea and salt for 30 days. Rooibos tea being a, an astringent, and also it prevents staphylococcus infection, staphylococcus infections. And then the wound healing itself is an old traditional, all over the world, traditional method of country poultice and all heal cell with certain um, medicines that are taken out of the garden and rinsed and put into that poultice and it's healed completely. And the support that the, that the woman had, um, not being afraid, able to deal with it herself, at home support, looking after a child and the community support is what a community intervention really will do to take off huge pressure off our hospital system to be able to provide the net where low risk patients are dealt with out of hospital and not just maternal, but we focus on maternal because the broad range of skills are applied in maternal. And then we want to look at the best impact on primary health care. So this is a case for community midwives and TBAs. There's a traditional birth attendance where this is supported all over the world. And I'd like to just briefly read some challenges by the World Health Organization on the 28th of the 7th this came in and it was published on May this year, 5th of May. The new report sounds the alarm on global shortage of 900,000 midwives, 6,600 midwives in South Africa that our communities don't have support of. And the statement goes fully investing in midwives by 2035 would avert roughly two thirds of maternal newborn deaths and stillbirths, saving 4.3 million lives per year, notwithstanding the other impacts that they have on education in community, direct support, psychological support, sexual disease, sexual harassment, and a myriad of other issues that midwives work with. And the key takeaway from the 2021 State of the World's Midwifery Report by the United Nations funded uh, platform on the UN Sexual Reproduction of Health Agency, World Health Organization, International Confederation of Midwives, which evaluates the midwifery workforce and relate health in 194 countries. Currently, the world needs essential workers to deliver sexual, re reproductive, maternal, newborn, and adolescent adolescent health care and 80% of these missing essential workers are midwives. A capable well-trained midwife can have enormous impact on childbearing women and their families. And there's nothing more important than strengthening and supporting the midwifery pro profession and those in leadership roles supporting this work to the full. So while I've been talking, those that have run through here, these are the challenges on the left, the in-clinical birth challenges that are faced, and then the case for community midwives and TBAs. Somewhere down the line, around about 1994, 1995, things started changing. There was a direct entry midwife program. Many, many 
tens of thousands of women and community were supported. And it seems that we've moved away from that. And it is very, very important that we review the situation. International best practice for our women and children. International best practice is what I'd like to put on the table. An evidence-based practice of the impacts that our communities are facing more and more every day. And that includes all of us here around the table today. We're all in community in our families. So this is a very, very important issue to review. I'd like to read these comments. How a woman is treated affects the woman she becomes. How she is treated during labor affects the type of mother she will be. Just the car and clock. Addressing this fact addresses many of the social ills we confront. Women are the building blocks of families and community. Women are disempowered from the beginning, from birth throughout their lives. Mothers need to be mothered and nurtured into motherhood and community midwives provide a safe environment. This matrix, which I hope everyone had a chance to see earlier, this matrix will be filled to support communities by the implementation again of the old systems that were here, the direct entry community midwives and TBA structure, where skills and referrals and development an efficient transfer can be affected into the system. Most of our people in this country go to tra traditional midwives or traditional healers as a first port of call. We know traditional midwives in urban areas. We have traditional midwives in rural areas. We mustn't only think of them out there who are carrying on practicing, who often don't get recognition. And they need here to affect this network effect of supporting family, the social workers, the clinics, the referral systems by properly trained midwives, where the interfaces can be made smooth. So this is a recommendation a, on a platform suggested to the Portfolio Committee on Health to review the services of midwives and TBAs, services that offer benefit, direct entry support, and direct involvement with the community is where we filter out 60 to 70 percent of the people needing maternal care keeping them in the community before coming into the referral system and that is part of the nhr response as well so some pilot projects there's a natural childbirth center and kzn i'll play a little clip for you in a second and there's these are how we assess impacts here on the left. Less secondary facilities, less transport, less staffing. Service access is near to the people, safer options. Mitigating the impact capacity of hospitals, particularly under the current situation. Less transport, less CO2, less time, less cost to the NHR under the value system. More resources available to community, more resources available to hospitals that aren't overladen. And then best practice education, evidence-based education and skills. And then for community, this will be a strategic community health impact. I have a few minutes left. I'm going to just pop through another one, which is a, a, a rural um, midwife operated unit in the Eastern Cape. The previous one is an urban childbirth center in KwaZulu-Natal staffed by um, uh, direct entry and um, sank trained midwives originally sank trained who are providing these systems and they are setting up the structure to engage with government on behalf of communities through a registry of community midwives a proper structure that ref that provides midwives the position to help maternal health and engage with the professionals in the health sector on a meaningful basis information on best practice and evidence-based practice so this requires a strategy and the strategy on a comment is the phasing out of the original green bar direct entry midwife program was the point of departure from in community care this was some 27 odd years ago it is critical to return maternal infant and primary health care to the community 
and it needs an amendment by Parliament of the Nursing Act to provide for direct entry in midwives and home-based carriers, a strategic review of Section 31 and relevant subsections, which will form a plat platform for rapid implementation of the NHI objectives and bringing community care on a structured basis back to the community interface. The South African Registry of Community Midwives have submitted a best practice and evidence-based practice platformed on the World Health Organization and International Community of Midwives Practices, submitted as a regulating body to implement education and regulatory systems for registered community midwives and TBAs an emergency, as an emergency response. We will close after I've played this clip. I'm just going to stop screen sharing and then open another clip. If I may, just to show. Morning. My name is Marianne. I'm a registered. Good morning. <laughs> share screen. Sorry, I'm going to share the screen again, if I may. And this is a little clip that I hope all of you can hear. My name is Marianne. I'm a registered midwife in South Africa. And I'd just like to tell you a little bit about the National Childbirth Centre here in Peter Marisburg, Raysal. A year ago, I came back from the UK and decided to join up with Dr. Davaraj and create the Natural Childbirth Centre in Peter Marisburg. Our main aim was to cater for all population groups from all socioeconomic levels. So we have different levels of entry into the unit, depending on, on what people can afford. I'm coming into the front door and we're going to go upstairs, which is where the un this first unit is. And the Department of Health has been to inspect uh, a few years ago and they so this is the birthing unit. At the moment, we have cleaners and receptionists. Yeah, this is Shlingiwe. Hello, <laughs> Shlingiwe. And this is our kitchen unit, um, which is available for staff and for workers and for uh, patients who want to prepare their food. We have a little information uh, desk and a postnatal bed with a beautiful crib for the babies, a sluice room, we have a loo and a shower. This is our seating area. It's very small and comfortable and this whole unit has now become the family unit. This is the birthing room with clinical area, a bed, So ladies and gentlemen, I have cut short. Um, can you hear me? I hope everyone can hear me. Um, I have cut short my presentation somewhat. Um, I hope everyone's on the bus fare babies in the, in the Eastern Cape video clip. Um, is a woman called Nomvula, who is um, 10 years under a qualified midwife training who is unable to get recognized um, and i'm going to play that um, clip now the sound isn't very good. This is Nomvula. She's just introducing to a rural birth house um, in the Eastern Cape. And this is what we call a midwife obstetric unit, MOU. And also solar system, since we don't have electricity. We are also having a 
bathroom. Luckily, we got the water because that is the main problem that we are facing on our country. Water. We, we got the bathroom, toilet, and also the shower. And we are also having a, a main room, the labor room, where where we are operating, if there is a woman in labor. Yeah, I think that's it. And about Okay. Righty ho. Thank you all of those who have been part of this brief uh, presentation. Um, I, I trust that the process was not too fragmented in the front uh, where we discussed how we look at planning. And I want to come right to the end again before I close and just say these issues in the screen share here around the planning of how these impact assessments work for the different modes of child support and, and, and maternal health in the area is all available. There's international data available. And um, if anyone would like further engagement on any of the aspects of this presentation, we would welcome that opportunity. We would also welcome the opportunity to engage directly with anyone who wants to discuss on supporting community and strategic projects um, that, we, that we would consider um, to assist community in, in the health sector and we have other projects running in the other sectors obviously education and economy and community on integrated approach to health for communities so that is the planning approach we take and i thank you for this opportunity okay thank you mr fowley for both the, the video clips presentation and also the prayer. You opened the, your presentation with the prayer. We uh, first time we experienced that with those who come to present to us. Thank you. I have members who would like to engage with your presentation. And those that have noted are the following. <clears throat> the first one will be Honorable Dr. Tembe Guayo, followed by um, Honorable Mashengwa. Ma the third is Honorable Gela. Fourth is Honorable Dr. Jacobs. And the five is Honorable Dr. Harvard. Am I leaving out anybody? Hello. Yeah, Honorable Munyai. Number six. Okay, and Dr. Harvard, number five. Honorable Munyai, number six. Yeah, okay, Honorable Harvard, you are number five, and number six is Honorable Munyai. Any other hand can, thereafter? Can you note me, Honorable Chair? Honorable Sokacha, you'll be number seven. Is that the last one? Okay. In that order, Honorable Members, starting with Honorable Dr. Chembeguayo, followed by Honorable Mashengwa, number three, Honorable Gela, number four, Honorable Dr. Jacobs. Number five, Honorable Dr. Harvard. Number six, Honorable Munyai. And number seven, Honorable Sokacha. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, I'm, well, I'm just repeating because that's what I wanted to say uh, initially, to say uh, it's for the first time in, in health uh, committee to have a presenter who would start uh, uh, presenting by uh, praying and praying for us and everybody. And uh, we thank you for that. And uh, you will always be remembered as Pastor Fauli. <laughs> 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 yes, we remember you as pastor. You are no more Mr. Faulir, but you are a pastor put, because you prayed for us. But Apolali Kuluma Mfundi. So when I go to my community in the Eastern Cape, the closer community, they call me Mfundi. So, so I must be behave myself. 
-hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Yes. But uh, I just would like to ask whether it's possible for you to circulate for us the first video, video clip, yes. because it was not audible. We couldn't even understand uh, what is it that was reflected in the video. And yet you used it as a, a supporting evidence to show us the challenges that were experienced by those communities so far. So we need to make a connection in what you have said to the, the, the video itself, if it's well, possible you. for you to do that. And uh, secondly, I, I just would like to, to have some more information on uh, this one, the traditional method of healing. The, the interesting one uh, where, where you talked about the rooibos tea. I can't and, do the other thing called the ATM. Honorable Sokacha, that ATM is working. I'm very okay. sorry, Chair. I'm very sorry, Chair. I'm very okay. sorry. Dr. Susan is, is okay. off. Continue, Dr. Timbegwai. Dr. Timbegwai. Her, her microphone is off, ma'am. Honorable Dr. Timbegwai, you, you are still yes, on the sorry, floor. Yes, sorry, sorry. I yeah. also, yes. Okay, I was just saying the second one, it was based on the, the, the traditional healing method of rooibos tea and salt that was used there. And then uh, just a bit of it. And But uh, the most important thing is how do we use a, a part of, of, of your presentation as part of the amendments, if maybe they may be, on NHI, because you, you, you didn't in actual fact, say for an example, take a section from NHI bill and say, this is something that I need to improve or amend. And this is a way that I think should best possibly be the substitute to what is reflected in, in, in the NHI. But all the same, I, in general, I enjoyed I would, your presentation. Pastor. Thank you, ma'am. I, I would request that we given the opportunity to submit into the NHR those very sections and the strategies uh, proposed, how the certain sections of the various acts should be changed to uh, affect... Sorry, Pastor. Sorry, Pastor, I think Dr. Dromo has got technological problems, but usually when we ask questions, we all have to ask questions and you respond okay, at you. the end. Not thank you. Yes, you'll do mine just okay, after thank everybody. You. Thank you Pastor. very much. Yeah, uh, that is true. Uh, hold on until all members have asked their questions. The next one is Olamu Mahlengwa. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank you, Dr. Susan. Uh, first of all, let me welcome the report. And you know, all the members enjoy the prayer. Thank you very much for that. I have a clarity seeking question to the PA root, even the name. <laughs> have uh, uh, something that you don't come up with it. B.A. Root says that it has a concern that nurses are not properly motivated to provide the best patient care. Is this an issue? that should be addressed by the NHI or it is something that can be addressed before the NHI? If it is, can address before NHI, what is your suggestion as the BA route to do to, uh, to have for us, your suggestion do have for us in connection with this demotivated of nurses. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Uh, we are really indeed uh, blessed uh, this afternoon. Uh, we really need God more than before. And if we put God first, uh, everything will be fine, will be okay. Thank you very much, Mfundisi. I'm also blessed. Uh, I've got a, a question that I want to ask. Uh, in your presentation, you are advocating for the reinstatement of um, the community uh, midwives and the green bar nurses by um, conducting a comprehensive review of the current nursing system education uh, in a maternal uh, support uh, training. Uh, I would like to get a clarity uh, on whether the nursing council has been uh, consulted uh, with uh, this proposal. And uh, was the chief nursing office uh, in the department uh, consulted uh, with this uh, proposal? And uh, lastly, did you make uh, comments on the recently uh, revised and published uh, human resource a health strategy. Um, that will be the question from my side. Thank you very much. Uh, God bless you, Mfundis. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation, uh, Mr. Fowler. Is it Fowler or Mr. Fowler? Uh, Fowler, like a chicken. Yes. <laughs> but yes, thank you very much for reminding us. Um, and you can see my hair is gray too. <laughs> of the good days when we had midwives coming to the homes and uh, babies were delivered at home. Maybe fourth, fifth child, etc., where we know there are fewer complications, but except for when there are i'm gonna have to switch my video my video of chair i see my network's becoming unstable so of course where there are not many complications expected with the delivery now um during the, those days i guess the burden as you had put it on the hospital system was much less i do not know what the situation is now as we stand now whether we still have home-based uh, midwifery services or as you put it also um, is a rural based um, and you also spoke about the traditional birth attendance whether those systems are still in place what you do note is that you're saying there is a lack of adequate maternal care and that you've also shown us two uh, scenarios where one is in the rural system, the video, and the other one is in, uh, in Peter Maritzburg, which is, of course is rural, but you're also showing that there's an obstetrician and gynecologist based at that premises. So in case things do go wrong, uh, that you also have somebody who can assist. Now, I, I, it just took you a bit long to get to the points you wanted to raise through all of your introductions, etc. but I think we got the gist of what you're saying. You're saying that if we don't have the system in place anymore, that we should be going back to the situation where we do have midwives providing service within the community, which is community-based in terms of delivery of babies and also other maternal and women's health care. That's what you're actually asking. And you also asked then an amendment to the Nursing Act to be made in, in that respect. And I, I want to put to you that maybe you should take that a bit further so that that is uh, looked at through your proposals to the department. And uh, it is not at the moment something that we're looking at in particular, we're looking at the NHI bill. And it was raised with you that you should send your recommendations with regards to, um, to uh, any suggestions with regards to the NHI bill. Now, we also know that uh, poor women in hard to reach areas are least likely to receive health care and that they carry the burden of maternal and perinatal mortality from complications of childbirth. That is a well-known fact. 
and so we appreciate this. I have two questions for you, and that is, do you propose that these community midwives should be practicing in independent practice? Or are you also proposing that this category must be included in the public sector facilities, including municipal clinics, etc.? And what would be the control mechanism to ensure that um, there is accountability with regards to those deliveries at home or within community settings as in the clinical settings that you have shown, two types of clinical settings which I had spoken about? And then if this community midwifery program is to be implemented, what are the risks associated with this program, especially in terms of the medical legal risks? And, and we do understand there are many risks with regards to delivery of babies and in the perinatal uh, period, um, as you've also indicated. And then of course, it is a, a, a service that can be um, a complementary service uh, that can be delivered according to the uh, level of expertise, especially in the low resource settings. And, mm. uh, but we need to be careful in terms of the regulation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Honorable Chair. Yeah. Uh, oh, and sorry. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Honorable Chair and the also presenter. And, the mo and the also nice blessing for everyone. I just have one question. Under NHI, how do you propose the primary health care midwifery program should be reimbursed? Can you share the reimbursement strategies that have been deployed in the UK, which you have given as an example? Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Honorable Chair. My first question is that the is those videos that we push that we're showing us has been authorized by those uh, those people that are there has given consent to this video that you are putting forward because I see one of them was running away until she was caught in the kitchen there, not knowing what to do, and the other one managed to escape. So. <laughs> I just want you to understand as to whether you have an uh, uh, authorization or consent of those of those videos that we are using here. And uh, the second one is that why on the same videos is that um, uh, with respect to somebody from UK or 10 from UK, there's no picture or video about that person. And, um, uh, and all that are local, they have video, so that I would want to get some clarity. But lastly, we know that uh, uh, and, and appreciate an integrated system planning approach and, and how it you know interfaces with community and primary health care intervention to reduce pressure on the high level of care. My question to you is the following. Please just listen carefully. Does your organization uh, be at root, support the objects of the NHI bill. And um, uh, and at this section of the bill that you would like to, the portfolio committee to look at the, to strengthen the NHI bill. Uh, let me just repeat again for your understanding. My question is that does your organization support the objects of the NHI bill and uh, the sections of the bill that you would want, you would like to pro the portfolio committee uh, to consider to strengthen the bill. That that will be the question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Chairperson. My my humble apology for speaking in different tongues. It's the prayer of the of the pastor that inspired me and filled me with the Holy Spirit to speak in different tongues, different to the one of the meeting. I'm definitely very sorry. Thanks, uh, Pastor, for, for your prayer and inspiration. Few questions, Honorable Chairperson. Um, the first one, um, the B root focus on child and maternal healthcare issues and the need to prioritize them 
is greatly appreciated because the same approach is known to be successful towards the improvement of the health status of communities in countries such as Japan when they prioritize this area, when they introduce their universal health coverage policies. My question then to you, uh, Mfundisi, uh, is how do we ensure that our proposed NHI bill is amended to accommodate, accommodate some of the proposals you have made in your presentation? My second question, not about Chairperson, <clears throat> sorry, can be at root indicate whether the same impact assessment results presented to this committee were brought before the Department of Health, especially because the issues raised in the presentation are real experiences of some people on the ground. One other area of clarity, did the assessment results reveal anything worth retaining in the health system under the national health insurance? And my last uh, point of clarity, Honorable Chair, in terms of accreditation of the community midwives, as the, 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 the pastor's organization develops standards and guidelines that can be considered to enhance section 4213 in the bill. Thank you very much, Honorable Chairperson. Thank you. Uh, Honorable Sokacha, uh, Mr. Fauli is also a pastor. That is why <laughs> he got inspired by your uh, got inspired by your prayer. From my side, I just wanted to check what is the scope of training of your traditional pet attendants, and uh, whether one after training them uh, there is any way of regulating. And three, is this program uh, known? or regulated by the by the nursing council because uh, it's closer to be a, a nurse assistant sort of uh, but in focusing on midwifery so just wanted to check your scope and number two the registration and uh, uh, known to the nursing council uh, i would also like to know you made mention of institutionalizing community midwifery uh, and you are saying it has the capacity to reduce uh, cesarean section rates. Uh, from your local and international experience, uh, how, what percentage would you be reflecting on as a, a reduction of cesarean section rate by this uh, by introducing this uh, uh, program? And lastly, midwifery, community midwifery. Uh, is there a category because we now know that midwives, there's a basic midwifery program and there's an advanced midwifery program. Are you having any, are, are you able to separate these two or a community midwifery is, is similar to a advanced midwifery? So if you can assist. Thank you. Those are the questions from the honorable members. I'm so sorry, I'll give you 12 minutes to reply. 12 minutes. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> I'm just, uh, first to, to, if I may, um, to, if I don't get the names right, they're not up in front of me. Um, I haven't taken them down, so I'll respond first. Firstly, to Dr. Tembakayo, um, thank you very much for your comments. Um, the, the request to circulate the first video, my suggestion is, is that I put this together in a pack that people can access um, and have a look at in their own time and put them in the right place. It's very clear from the presentation. And secondly, she was interested in the wound healing, the traditional method. Well, that was one example. And there's uh, healing modalities on both the allopathic, which is on our very wonderful medical system that we enjoy, um, and and the, the high level of that. The secondly is is the care that we have, uh, and how we care for our communities, and how natural medicines can play a very very serious part. And this is subject of a, of a lot of research um, in various faculties at universities. Um, biology lab laboratories and 
evid anecdotal evidence of communities. So there is a, a large range of not just natural medicines or support medicines to the allopathic system, but techniques which are vitally important. Techniques on how to manage things like shoulder dystocia, who have very, very high uh, positive outcomes when these techniques are used and they're not learnt in the hospitals. Um, very few nurses and midwives and in fact obstetricians know of a lot of the techniques that are, are used by community midwives traditionally over many thousands of years that actually make pos positive impacts. Um, in, insofar as the NHI bill, what we are talking about here in the presentation is not to go so much into the detail. We can address the detail if this forum would like to take this further. Um, we are quite happy to do that, but it is not just the NHI bill. The NHI bill is basically the framework for a medical aid or medical support for the most vulnerable of our communities, all of us who who engage with the public sector and the public system. And the whole system that I drew on the graph needs to be looked at for the interface and how it works together, how cross education is sharing, how the risks are mitigated against. I must say right at this outlet, right now that we are talking about low risk women whose blood can be accessed, their, their HB can be assessed, they can look at their portfolio and their prof profile, how they live, what their nutrition situation is like. And in that way, to answer a question right at the end, I'll come back to again, the 70% cesarean rate, 55 to 70% cesarean rate in the public sector can be reduced, according to the World Health Organization, to a 15 to 20% intervention. Only high-risk uh, uh, patients get, get referred. And this is part of the system that the bill will use to ensure its service, service providers are providing the right level of service. Honorable Munchlangwana, thank you very much for your question. The question is, what does the organization say, Beatrice, is the nurse's problem that can be addressed before the NHR? I think one of the things we're trying to point out here is that over many years, problems have become systemic in the care system in South Africa. This is echoed right across the communities and none more so than the mothers of all our communities that have and continue to have experiences where compassionate care doesn't seem to exist anymore. It's few and far between. I've personally experienced it because I belong to the public health care system. I've been in a situation where the care has fallen sh short. And when you're doing an assessment of critical pivot areas, key points of pressure where we can help communities where gaps are, the gap in service and support of, of birthing mothers and children is profound and there is enough evidence and a whole presentation can be done on that if required by this committee or the Honourable Mshlangwana. Honourable Gela, I would really echo your comment. If we put God first, everything will be fine. I thank you for that. I would ask on the reinstatement of the Green Bar community nurses. This is an example. The Green Bar program was the interface of community where midwives, midwives were known to ride on their bicycles into their communities. They at the interface of the community, mostly they live there. The systems that we have put in place for the last 27 years have moved us away from that, more towards allopathic. I'm just going to put something on the table. Clarity on whether the nursing council and the chief nursing officer. Um, the important thing here is that the nursing council, the chief nursing officer of SANC, need to be prompted to engage with the structure that can talk their language, that can do this hold these kind of conversations because they're sensitive to their structures 
they're very sensitive on the ground where a lot of the care systems have been politicized and a lot of our medical systems have gone so far away from supporting mothers and children with natural practices where some and this is not my place to comment here but when you get hospitals in the private sector with a 90 percent cesarean rate due to the need to do cesareans to cover a million rand insurance a year we have something wrong in the systems insofar as the nursing council we need to deal with all structures we need specifically to move midwifery internationally the movement towards mid midwifery is a profession on its own not a nurse's job a nurse midwife is someone who graduates and our nurse midwives in this country as i understand it become midwives after 15 births traditional midwives do 100 200 births and none of the experience is regulated or checked and this is a vital aspect of putting in structures to provide proper risk-free as possible and profit transfer and referral systems we would love to have the opportunity to speak to any of the structures and if anyone has any connections that we can get through it would be a wonderful thing the recently revised health strategy i must admit i cannot comment on that but i will do so i haven't had time today but i'm happy to do so on that and i thank you for that dr jacobs the, the reflection of Dr. Jason, Jacobs is very important. Midwives come in to the baby delivered at home, low risk babies delivered at home, I might say, where people are supported and our young women are supported, those that have been abused and those that are having to deal with all the problems that we face today, not just mentioning the pandemic and the loneliness and the fear, but the sexual and gender abuse, the sexual violence that they face, women are terrified of going into the hospital because they they're not feeling nurtured we need to change that and going into the houses well if we have midwife operated units as is envisaged and as is shown on the on the on the screen on the presentation those are self-funded they support the system the one in peter maritzburg has the potential of dealing with 60 low risk risk babies in a nurturing situation with all the advice that can go with family care people doing uh, um, youth and, and management of the partners, the men, getting them to understand their responsibilities. All of this happens with a community midwife. And that doesn't happen in our, in, our, in our structured, the allopathic healthcare system that we have coming into clinics at the first point. We need to look at the functionality of these systems and how we can improve them. And we need to look at legislation of how we can structure this and also give people with skills the lady Nomvusa in the last film, who wasn't very clear because she was turning away, was trained for 10 years under a SANC qualified, highly qualified community midwife who's delivered thousands of babies. And in 10 years, she's unable to get a route for any recognition for her skills. Those are the things we have to look at job creation, opportunities, and risk management. The home based uh, midwifery service currently in place has been broken down, it's unsupported. The move away from traditional midwives by the medical situation and the non-recognizing has marginalized them. We are in engagement with them. They have formed their structures. There's a wealth of knowledge and cross-sharing that can happen that can really help communities. And that is right across the board. That goes right into the obstetric world where we need to understand the physiology of women and our babies and that is supported because our medical system is on a time-based system and having in a woman labor for 12 hours which is an easy thing becomes frustrating for everyone we need to look at nurturing systems and that would cover the lack of adequate care and the and the the image of dr deveraj dr deveraj uh, is a retiring man he's supportive of of a high level of care for women who need care and psychological care a lot of them which isn't available to them and he just has his practice downstairs from that birthing center i believe he's supportive but um his practice just happened to be that's their medical center in an urban area the, the reintroduction of direct entry and the structures of that has been taken up by a group of midwives uh, who are connecting all the midwives 
we want to support the SANC train systems, which need support on, on many things. Um, one of them, the poor rural su woman suffering in maternity care, I've heard it right across the board. And unfortunately, there's a lot of cultural violence as well in some of the hospitals by various parties. And this is not a condemnation of the whole care system. It is specific that maternal care is lacking. It is specific in some areas that are lacking, but there are some wonderful caring nurses, compassionate caring nurses um, that I've experienced myself. But there's a lot of gaps in learning. These midwives practice only in community. That's where their focus is. They are the bridge between the referral system where high-risk women or women who have complications have to be referred. They practice in midwife operated units, which are semi-clinical settings. And in low rest area, risk areas, they support people to birth where they can with their family around them, with their husbands and quiet conditions so that the maximum oxytocin flow and can, can get the babies out naturally. So the regulatory body, which has been formed, needs to work together with the current systems, with working together in, the, in, in, in supporting our communities to find ways to do it and not just standing back and saying, we have to ask why. We have to ask why the situation is it, as it is, why women aren't supported and why South Africa and a lot of Africa is behind in maternal care where midwives take the forefront of maternal care in many countries around the world. In Holland, which is the highest level of care, you cannot go to a referral hospital unless you've had a fully qualified midwife who has done proper checks and proper reviews and physiology and your background checks and to create supportive births. So the regulatory body, which we have recommended engaging with is the South African Registry of Community Midwives who's getting broad representation to be able to sit around the table and discuss these things. I'd like to put something on the table that very few people know. Two Most minutes. Our, sorry? Thank you. Two minutes. Two minutes. Thank you. Who is the person in Mario, Mario's video? It's uh, that uh, I think the lady from the UK in there was doing interviews for a bus fare babies program, uh, which is uh, NGO funded, internationally funded, all over Africa, but they get funds that they have to take back to their funders um, of how they're helping women. Does our organization support the objects of the NHI bill? Yes, it does. But on condition that the community's needs are served and evidence based practice and best practice is applied to maternal health, in fact, to all our practices. There are sections of the bill where we would like to strengthen them. There are sections of the bill that might need to be reviewed. Um, Sir Simon, thank you. Beatrut is an organization that was built for community from late 1994 right through to, in fact, when I, I, I was Tata Mandela's architect in the Eastern Kapikunu, and we spoke about health issues there. From 1994, we have built structures and systems in place. Um, from 2005 and six, our planning systems have been introduced at Amatola in the Eastern Cape. In the, those districts, working with the traditional healers on HIV and AIDS mitigation. So we work in the six primary impact sectors, not only in health, but health is a key factor of community support. And that's why we're addressing it today the group today and the, and the portfolio committee. Um, we focus on maternal child health and issues because that by far has the greatest effect of helping communities, helping our mothers, dealing with gender equity, gender violence, unsupported families. And it has a direct effect on our children and the foundation of our families in this country. This is an emergency response we want to talk about. The bills are amended by discussion around with the relevant uh, legal structures and the people who put the bills together, the people like yourselves who input into it, so we can sit together as, as family members, as our president says, we can sit around and work out best practice 
and which ways we should go. Um, community midwives training could enhance section 41.3 of the bill. I, I'm not able to comment on that right now. I would, I would, um, um, the assessment of the health, is there reveal anything worth retaining? Yes, our structures are in place. We have the most fantastic legislation in the world, the most fantastic constitution, environmental protection and community protection. We just have to make sure that we apply it properly. Uh, you, scope of training of the birth of yeah. tenants and registration of those. Um, a lot of them are certified professional midwives, uh, overseas trained at a very high level. A lot of them are SANC trained midwives. Yes, SANC does know of some of them. SANC also knows some of them that they cannot get registered, even though they, they can't get assessed. This is a structure that we need to look at. It's the level of training how we can have community midwives training other midwives and rolling it out into the community and what the, the internationally accepted impact on community is, is by having midwives at the interface of community health. We have basic midwifery, we have structures uh, in place that have been looked at by this organization, the community midwives organization, they're looking at levels. For instance, traditional birth attendants, their levels need to be assessed. They need to become part of the process. They are delivering babies in the communities and they're gonna be delivering more babies in the community under the current situation. And we need to manage those risks. Transfer into hospital should really not be more than 30%. And at 30% of transfers into hospital for low risk women, we really, really start making an impact on the cost to the country, the I'm health of the community. Thank you. Close. Yes. Uh, it was very nice listening to you. Uh, you, you speak uh, like a community uh, activist <laughs> on women's rights, women's health and child health. And uh, maybe you should go around the country assisting us to get people motivated to do half of what you are doing and what of, half of what you are saying. We can get a better country. Thank you very much. Uh, we will keep in touch with you uh, because uh, some of the members here are saying your presentation has been educational, uh, engaging, but also an eye opener and giving hope to some of us that uh, there are still South Africans out there who have this desire to, start, to strongly support community obstetrics which is the key, as we are saying, to mother and child uh, programs. Uh, I'm afraid we can put it at the close now, but the last 30 seconds, your closing comments. I would like to say a quick prayer of closing, if that is fine with everyone. Dear God, we thank you for this opportunity to engage with the Portfolio Committee. We thank you, God, for our place at the table today for the communities of South Africa, the women and families, the children and the men of this country. May we be guided, may we have peace, and may our work be fruitful, Lord. Thank you, God. Amen. 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 Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Have a good day and the evening. Praise the Lord. This, uh... Thank you. Hallelujah. Nkosi, nkosi. Siyabonga. Thank you. Okay, uh, our day is going to end with the next presentation, honorable members. Uh, the last presenter has indicated challenges and therefore we might have to reschedule. Now we hope that as uh, Mr. Fowley is leaving, a group that is presenting rare diseases in South Africa, something quite an interesting document, a story to listen to, will be logging in. If they are, we will now give them the platform to do that. And uh, just a minute and two for members to stretch as they are given sharing rights on the screen. Uh, and then we'll start immediately two minutes after four. Thank you.
Okay, welcome to the presenters, NHI in the context of rare diseases. You are called an organization rare diseases in South Africa. Looking forward to hearing what you are about to say to us. Uh, you have 45 minutes to make a presentation. You introduce your members and then uh, you present 45 minutes. Thereafter, honorable members will engage with your presentation uh, and the clarity seeking questions and then we'll come back to then clarify those questions. So your 35 minutes starts now, thanks. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. Um, by way of introduction, my name is Kelly Duplessis. I am the founder and CEO of Rare Diseases South Africa, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Dr. Helen Malherber, who is our Director of Research. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the committee uh, for the opportunity to present our comments on the National Health Insurance Bill, which we believe is a vital piece of information and legislation which seeks to make real the constitutional promise of universal access to quality health care within South Africa. I would like to firstly state that Rare Diseases South Africa as an organization is in full agreement that the current two-tiered health system is inequitable and there is a need to change healthcare funding. We are further of the agreement that the right of everyone to access healthcare services means that everyone should be able to access quality services on the basis of need rather than the basis of ability to pay. And this agreement is unequivocal. However, this does not require agreement with the way in which the change to the health system and the establishment of the NHI fund has been laid out in the NHI bill. And disagreement with aspects of the bill does not in our case equate to anti-poor sentiment or satisfaction with the status quo as it exists currently. Instead, the purpose behind our criticism is that we are concerned and we want to ensure the health system reforms that are required are in fact implementable and sustainable long term. Our submissions detail our concerns to the bill, removing existing forms of access to healthcare services to certain categories of vulnerable populations, particularly rare disease patients. I would like to give a brief overview of what we'll be discussing today, being um, in terms of our agenda. Um, it's first going to be obviously a little bit of an introduction to us as an organization, um, as well as the context of rare diseases within the South African space. Um, our discussion points with regards to the bill itself, um, as well as the implementation of universal health care, and then finally our closing. So if I can start with a little bit of information regarding rare diseases South Africa. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization established in 2014. We are also a nonprofit company as well as a public benefit organization. And we have a membership base of over 5,000 people with approximately 144 disease specific support groups, 1,200 healthcare professionals, uh, 1,000 caregivers, as well as patients. And in our role as patient advocates, we have aided numerous patients in the fight to have their diseases recognized and treated. Our aim is to increase the awareness around rare conditions, provide support and practical aid to patients and families impacted by these conditions as well as congenital disorders, and to establish a network of, between all partners who have the ability to prevent, affirm, treat, and ultimately improve the quality of life of those infected individuals. Our vision is a South Africa where those impacted by rare diseases and congenital disorders access life-saving treatment and supportive care for improved quality of life. Our mission is simply to bridge the gap to improved quality of life for those impacted and our principles revolve around equality, care, dignity and empowerment. In terms of the global context, only 5% of rare diseases have an FDA approved drug. I think if anything COVID over the last 18 months has taught us is that anxiety around the need to have some form of treatment um, and care plan developed for a condition. I think COVID has bring, uh, brought about many of the, the challenges that a rare disease patient faces in terms of isolation, uh, stigma, um, we've, you know, mask wearing. The rare disease patient for many years has had a good understanding as to what it's like to have to do what you have to do to protect your own health. 
And now, um, you know, wearing masks has not been an unusual thing for those who are immune compromised for many years. And before we were stigmatized and discriminated against for that mask wearing and how the times have changed that now you receive the same level of criticism, if not more, for simply ignoring to wear your mask. I think the, the time that we've spent in lockdown, being away from our families, um, being fearful of something invisible that you might not be able to see or understand, having a lack of awareness and a lack of information to medical data and literature, combined with the fear and almost desperation to develop a treatment or a cure has really given people an insight into the life of a rare disease patient. Approximately 30% of children with a rare disease will not live to see their fifth birthday. And that is a very, very scary statistic. There are over 7,000 conditions which are considered rare globally, 80% of which are genetic, and 50% of people that are affected by rare diseases are children. It's important to realize that more than 350 million people are affected globally by a rare condition. So if you took all the rare diseases and you put them into one country, it would be the third most populated country in the world. And that statistic of 350 million people accounts for more than cancer and HIV patients globally. So it is a significant chunk of the global population that is impacted by rare diseases and therefore they are not as rare as they are perceived to be and in actual fact they are collectively common. When you look at the context within South Africa, we estimate based on model data an estimated 3.7 million South Africans will be impacted by a rare condition. And the quality of life for patients impacted by rare disease are not necessarily always dependent solely on the severity of the illness, but rather also on the availability of treatment, the health system which they are accessing, services through, the broad, broader social support, as well as access to supportive care. When you take into account the earlier statistic that I mentioned of only 5% of patients having access to an FDA approved treatment for rare disease, you will understand that supportive care being um, treatment of symptoms, pain control, um, mobility aids, et cetera, form a bulk uh, component of being able to provide any form of service for these patients. And some of the challenges that we face in South Africa, we firstly have this dual healthcare system, which we're going to be discussing in detail today. There's a lack of knowledge and awareness. We have a lack of data. Uh, there is no local definition for rare diseases in South Africa. Internationally, um, we have adopted the one in 2000, but there is no local definition that has been um, written into literature or legislation. And we also do not have an orphan drug policy. So all of this results in a limited access and we've developed some solutions there, which I will not go into today because it doesn't bear fruit on this particular discussion. So the complex nature of rare diseases coupled with the limited access to treatments and services means that family members are often the primary source of solidarity, support and care for their loved ones. And once again, it's important to reiterate that rare diseases are not necessarily just a health care issue and they have a broader, a broader social impact as well. Some of the challenges that you find within these households that are caring or are affected by a rare disease patient include uh, guilt, particularly with regards to the genetic component of these diseases, divorce, limited education and work opportunity, isolation, depression and anxiety, stress, stigma and financial burdens. So if I can now come into the context of some of our submissions, um, uh, reiterate the fact that we are committed to the improvement of healthcare systems in South Africa and we are eager to find solutions to better meet the needs and ensure the care of the population of South Africans who are impacted by rare diseases and congenital disorders. And we always remain committed to engaging with various stakeholders, including the Department of Health, to find solutions to access um, healthcare for the rare disease and congenital disorder community. So if I can start with regards to the 2018, um, the 2018 bill we submitted written feedback as well. And that has come, you know, is, is really just better understanding the fact that RDSA has established a growing presence within the African continent and therefore we have a, a relatively um, good idea of how rare diseases are playing out across the continent, but particularly with regards to South Africa. And we want to see an equitable healthcare system that allows the opportunity to improve societal relationships and quality of life. Rare diseases are often forgotten when funding decisions are made. 
and the current format does not seek to address this vital issue. We see this on a daily basis within both the private and the public healthcare sector. Our submission will also focus on the discriminatory nature of the exclusion of the rare disease patient, the access to high cost innovative medicine, the limited access to genetic services and diagnostics, and the overall discrimination of having comprehensive and equitable access to the services provided by NHI. Finally, we will address the need to ensure meaningful engagement and participation of rare disease patients and caregivers in the various bodies established by the NHI bill. We will not obviously be commenting on all aspects of the NHI bill, but only those that we feel are relevant to and provide context to the work that we do. And we have heard various submissions uh, over the previous few days um, with regards to the general context. So we will focus our, our um, position, particularly with regards to the context of rare diseases. So the first um, point is that the bill makes provision that a user may purchase healthcare services that are not reimbursed by the fund through private healthcare insurance. However, the Medical Schemes Amendment Bill, which was published for comment in June of 2018, states that the registrar may, after consultation with the minister, restrict the extent of benefits offered by a medical scheme having regards to the benefits and services offered under the NHI fund. This leaves rare diseases South Africa unclear as to where and if at all rare diseases will be considered for funding. And this is a pertinent issue. The bill does not address the funding of NHI. This is concerning as it raises hopes of comprehensive cover at no cost. However, the framework and the funding for the NHI should have been in place before proposing a bill of this magnitude in our opinion. The NHI also claims to prioritize services to those populations most in need. This would certainly cover the rare disease community. However, it is unclear if rare diseases will be covered at all by the fund. In, with regards to given to the previously published um, NHI benefits framework, there is no provision made for rare diseases coverage at all that we can see. It is further included at section 9A that the quality health service benefits should be received. What the definition of quality health services benefits are, however, remains unclear. And to ensure that quality health care is received for a member of the rare disease community often means that expensive, novel medication needs to be utilized and very often medication that is required off-label. Will the fund make provision for the procurement of these medications? And if so, how would one not do this via a tender process, taking into account the rarity of the conditions and the low numbers in which these products would need to be procured? It also, as section 9D states that a user cannot be denied access to health service benefits for unreasonable grounds. This would open up every rare disease case to a potential challenge then in terms of the fund. We are also concerned that the absolute discretion of the Benefits Advisory Committee and the fund in setting benefits is problematic. There it doesn't seem to be a framework provision to guide how those are to be set, to cover serious and debilitating diseases, to prevent or ameliorate conditions that could lead to disability or social exclusion. Excuse or me, Chairperson. Chairperson. Chairperson, I, I just need to find out. Um, I can't see where the sections that uh, yes, the presenter is talking about. It's not on the screen. She's repeating the very same <coughs> mistakes that were repeated by the previous presenters. So that, uh, and she put it up what she's reading here. I mean, there's nothing that she's talking about here, except one line that doesn't even create a summary of what she's talking about. We have had a challenge, ma'am, when you have bullet points here and you have a different uh, presentation elsewhere. Why don't you put that presentation that we are talking to, rather than looking at the bullet points and hope that we remember everything that we are saying on the other side without looking at it? Uh, so I could possibly do that, except that I haven't yeah. prepared the slideshow forum uh, will format at this particular point. And the other issue is that the text would be relatively uh, tiny, um, which which is why I reverted back to the bullet points. This was submitted. However, this entire submission uh, was also provided to the committee in written format. We do have we do note that, but we do have a problem to do that word document and bring it here rather than the bullets. Because okay. we are, we are, you are summarizing that block. That big document that you sent us, but let's not no. share, let's share that with you. 
Okay, all right. Um, what I what I will do if I can, I'm about to hand over to my colleague to address the following two points. And while she's speaking to that, I will then um, try to switch over. Um, she will be referring to graphs in her presentation that are included on this particular slideshow that are not included in, um, in the oral that I'm reading at the moment. So once she has completed, we will then change over to the Word document if, that's, if that suits the committee. Okay, I'll continue then. Um, we are obviously, with regards to the concerned areas of speciality care, um, we may not, we, there is unclarity whether rare diseases will be treated and funded by the NHR fund, or further may be in locations which cannot reasonably be accessed by a rare disease patient. And we see this playing out on a daily basis as well within the tertiary services. So if I can, I'm going to hand over to our, my colleague, Dr. Helen Malhoba, who will be discussing diagnostic services as well as um, the human genetics. And then from there, I will then switch over to a, um, our, the a Word version of the presentation. Okay. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Honorable Chair and Honorable Members. I'm just going to refer to this slide and these three bullet points. Um, briefly, just to talk about the um, diagnostic services, the PNB criteria, and the issue of progressive realization. Now, um, sorry, we're just reorganizing this site. Please excuse us. So, diagnostic services, um, we are concerned about how the current lack of diagnostic services and infrastructure will be addressed. And in the slides that follow yes, this one, I'm bringing that in the road document. What you are reading, bring it also, please. Read that from us on the screen. That's what we said. The next presenter will do that. We'll switch over and then read from your screen. Okay, we're just doing that for you. I'm not sure if we're sharing that screen. No, I'm going to switch it now. Um, there. Um, I'm just going to enlarge it and then I'm going to just share the correct screen. Okay. Much better, much better. Okay. Thank you. Um, so speaking to diagnostic services, the initiation of effective treatment and disease management is virtually impossible without a correct and accurate diagnosis, especially from a cost coding perspective. The current public health situation doesn't allow for efficient, timely, accurate and cost effective testing, resulting in incorrect diagnosis or late diagnosing, diagnosis, resulting in progression of disease beyond the point where a suitable initiation of medication and treatment is considered cost effective with reduced efficacy and often it comes too late for the patient. The very nature of rare conditions, especially those that are genetic, results in continuous progression from early on in childhood, which is why the need for quick diagnosis and immediate initiation of medical management is so necessary. The human resource shortages, as well as the lack of skills and training, is coupled with unreliable and faulty technical equipment that often isn't um, updated and often isn't um, maintained well to make the case for ineffective current services. Moving on to the PMB criteria in point 73, 74, and 132, further clarification on how the chronic disease list will be determined is required. Currently, the PMB list covers many chronic condition, conditions and is in need of an update to ensure cover coverage of other unlisted conditions which meet the need for chronic continuous and continuous based care. However, it would be completely nonsensical to remove diseases currently covered on this list that have been previously determined to qualify for this level of treatment and intervention. Moving on to the issue of progressive realization, as indicated in points 3, 106 and 111, children's rights are, are fundamental human rights and thus their right to access healthcare is not subject to progressive realization. This was reported in the paper um, by Malherber et al in 2016. While it is realized that the NHI will not provide everything for everyone, we've got to be realistic here, as outlined in point 125, not providing healthcare services for children affected by rare conditions is a violation of their fundamental human and constitutional rights. And finally on this, the slide that we're referring to is the lack of prioritization of rare diseases as a healthcare issue. 
Point 17 specifies that vulnerable groups, such as women, orphans, the aged, adolescents, and people with disabilities, women, and rural communities will be prioritized. Many of those that are living with disabilities are as a result of rare diseases and congenital disorders, which can result in lifelong mental, physical, auditory, or visual disability. Many rare diseases are misdiagnosed or remain undiagnosed, and the cause of death is often incorrectly reported. They're often um, hidden under the burden of infectious diseases. As a result, the true contribution of rare diseases to the burden of disease is underestimated and inaccurately assessed in South Africa. It's therefore essential that this is rectified and within the context of point 118, that those affected or at risk of rare diseases are considered a vulnerable group that are in greatest need and experiencing the greatest difficulty in obtaining care. We're now moving on to focus on the lack of human resources in the field of medical genetics and medical genetic services. And it is imperative that capacity building efforts as part of the NHI include medical genetics as per point 20. The efforts outlined in points 34 and 35 have not benefited the medical genetic services sector, which has declined as a result of competing health priorities over the past decades. And this has been documented extensively in the literature. The status of capacity in the sector um, I'm going to revise these statistics in a graph below, so I'm going to just move on. I will come back and explain that. Nurses are agreeably the backbone of the South African health system in point 37, and it's essential that the curricula for nursing colleges and universities are standardized and updated, including relevant content to take advantage of genetic discoveries to improve healthcare, especially in primary healthcare settings where genetics training is currently inadequate, Specialist training is also required to develop genetic nurses and genetic nurse counsellors to supplement the shortfall that we have of med medical geneticists and genetic counsellors, as recommended in the 2001 policy guidelines for the management and prevention of genetic disorders, birth defects and disabilities. Please note, honourable members and honourable chair, that this policy guideline of 2001 is currently undergoing revision um, by the National Department of Health and we are involved in that process. With regards to referral services, the shortage of key healthcare professionals made in point 79, key specialists for the medical genetic services sector need to be addressed in order for the referral services outlined in point 128 and 160 of the NHI white paper to function, especially with the lack of medical geneticists in six provinces, which is the current situation. Based on current capacity, planned patient transportation between the levels of care in point 160 will be required to transport referred patients with rare diseases to medical geneticists and genetic counselors from all other provinces to those three provinces where there are currently existing medical genetic services. However, these transport costs are likely to be prohibitive, making it more cost effective to develop genetic services in other provinces where they are currently lacking for these vulnerable groups. And we also highlight the role of telemedicine and virtual consultations that will need to be developed and further implemented. On the screen now is just a snapshot of South Africa in terms of in epidemiological terms. The map on the left shows the breakdown of all the provinces of South Africa and the percentage that is indicated on each province is the percentage of births that occur in that province and also the percentage of rare diseases and congenital disorders that are experienced in each province as a breakdown of the total national proportion. So in 2020, we have a population of just under 60 million. We have a very young population with nearly 30% less than 15 years of age. We have approximately a million births annually. Our births have gone down slightly. And the large proportion of our country back in 2012, and it's likely to be high now, is urbanized. We have one of the lowest fertility rates in Africa, somewhere between 1.9 and 2.9. It's an average of about 2.4. And our life expectancy has increased nicely. We're now um, in 2020 at just under 63 years for males and 68.5 for females. Our under five mortality rate, which is the chance of a child dying under the age of five in South Africa, is 34 per thousand live births. The infant mortality rate, the chance of a baby dying, a child dying under the age of one year, is 25 per thousand live births. And neonatal mortality rate, the chance of a, an infant dying under the age of four weeks or 28 days from birth is 11 per thousand. We have still have a significant HIV um, infection rate 
uh, in the 14, sorry, the 15 to 49 year old range is um, 13 percent. And advanced maternal age is increasing in South Africa. And in 2019, it was reported as 16 percent of mothers were above the age of 35. And of course, we have our dual health system, 85 or 86 percent state and 15 percent private. When it comes to the capacity of medical genetic services in 2000 and one compared with 2021, this table really represents a snapshot in time of where we were, what we need and where we are now and where we're falling short. So if we look at the first column, we have medical geneticists. It was recommended in 2001 that we have one per two million of the population, which would mean that we should have had 20 in 2001. We only had four, that's one per 11 million of the population. Today, in terms of medical geneticists, we have nine in the state sector. And this is one for 4.5 million of the population. And this population has been adjusted to exclude the private sector. So these are actual numbers in terms of how many medical geneticists are serving the population. The number that we should have is 25. We are falling far short. Genetic counselors equally, we have currently 7.5. We should have 85. So we have one genetic counselor serving over nearly 7 million of the population. We don't have the updated stats for the medical scientists and those that do the genetic testing. We did have 50 in 2001. We need 110. Provincially, how this breaks down in state funded posts, you can see that all the rows across here are the provinces in South Africa. The number of medical geneticists currently in post in South Africa is nine, but it's only in three of the provinces, four in Gauteng, one in KZN, who is serving 11 million people as a single genetic medical geneticist. And in Western Cape, we have four. In the other six provinces, we have zero. There are a number of vacant posts, but a lot of these are being frozen and they're not being filled, particularly because of the additional pressure from the COVID pandemic. There are a number of registrars in training. As you can see, there are seven, but there are not enough posts that those can then, then be filled. So a large number of our med trained medical geneticists and our genetic counselors we are losing through emigration to other countries because they can't get posts here once they're qualified. Or they go to the private sector, which is over, already overpopulated. In terms of genetic counselors, they are only in two provinces, which is in Gauteng and Western Cape, and they are also vacant posts. So that means two of the provinces are serving the entire country in terms of genetic counselling. To contextualise rare diseases and congenital disorders, they are a non-communicable disease, um, and this makes up a significant portion. And rare diseases and congenital disorders are the first non-communicable disease that is experienced by people in life. And they need to be classified as such within the context of the NHI, as well as in a number of the strategic documents that um, feed into the NHI by the National Department of Health. Many of the diseases of lifestyle that are referred to in point 188 are actually multifactorial CDs. For example, they have a genetic predisposition. We're talking about familial cancers, for example, we're talking about endocrine disorders. We're talking about things like diabetes. Diabetes type one is actually a congenital disorder and a rare disease, but it is not contextualized as such. And this is an important um, clarification that needs to be made. The burden of disease represented by congenital disorders and rare diseases is significant. And the white paper excludes the contribution of this group, which um, into the burden of disease. And it must be noted that the quadruple burden of disease outlined in point 96, which includes child mortality and lists several NCDs, but it fails to specify CDs or the genetic component of these diseases. In point 98, the reduction in neonatal infant and child mortality is outlined, but it is the fact that it has stagnated with no further reduction since 2011 is excluded and it's not noted despite extensive literature supporting this. Although South Africa is back in positive epidemiological transition and the infant mortality rate and under five mortality rates are now lower than prior to the HIV AIDS and TB epidemics, to achieve further significant reductions in child mortality, we have to address non-HIV causes of death and disability. This is represented quite nicely in this graph. On the left axis, we have the number of deaths per thousand live births. And on the right, we have the HIV prevalence. The gray line, and the yellow line are child and infant mortality. That's the number of children that are dying. 
overall. And we saw that was coming down from 1960, and then it started increasing in the early 90s due to this green line of HIV. The blue line that we're seeing here is the longevity, that's the life expectancy. How, are you, how old are you likely to live to at birth? But what we can see, and the most important thing on this graph, is this pink circle here where we can see the stagnation. We are not reducing child and infant mortality in South Africa. And the significant reason why is because we are not tackling rare diseases and congenital disorders. And we are not going to meet the SDG target for IMR, which is way down here, unless we can move from here to here. So the previous hidden burden of CDs and rare diseases is beginning to emerge from underneath infectious diseases. As these communicable or infectious diseases are controlled and overall child death is reduced, the proportion of infant and child deaths from CDs is increasing. So the numbers aren't increasing, they were always there, but the proportion is increasing. We have data from the 2012-13 Perinatal Problem Identification Program indicates that congenital abnormalities, which are mostly rare diseases, and a subset of congenital disorders have overtaken infection as the third leading cause of death during the first week of life in neonates. And this was recorded in their report. And so further anecdotal evidence has come out from the Western Cape, also demonstrating that rare diseases have overtaken infection as a cause of death. This proportion is going to increase, and it's going to follow the trend in industrialized countries where CDs are the leading cause of death in infants and children where they account for up to 28, it's actually over a third of deaths now in the under fives um, in high income countries. And that's where we're headed and we're not prepared. Governments usually recognize the importance of developing comprehensive genetic services when the infant mortality rate reaches 30 to 40 deaths per li thousand live births, because they realize we can only get further significant reductions in child mortality if we tackle these rare diseases. We are currently, I stand to be corrected here, this should be 25 per thousand live births for our infant mortality rate. We are way beyond this point when we should have these comprehensive, comprehensive services in place. This graph nicely demonstrates um, the bars represent countries and literally as the countries develop, you've got more um, underdeveloped countries on the left and higher income countries that are further developed on the right. And these are the number of deaths um, in infants. As the number of deaths decreases, the, the proportion of deaths due to birth defects, congenital disorders, rare diseases increases. This Hello. arrow is where South Africa is now. Can I interject a bit? In the last 30 minutes, we have been uh, exposing the extent of the rare disease in the world and in South Africa. Now, you have not come to what we have requested you to come to, to say. And uh, I'm just indicating that you have taken 30 minutes of your time just exposing the extent of the rare disease in the country. Detail. Thank you, Honorable Chair. We will just now proceed to um, conclusions. Just going to scroll back down. If you can just give me one sec. So having having listened to the context i think it is we it's it's quite clear and even the the comment to say that we've just been exposed is an indication um that rare diseases are not discussed as much as they should be they're not contextualized they're not prioritized and we are of the position that the nhi in its current format will not do what is necessary to alleviate this I would like to conclude with regards to the principles of universal healthcare, where we have to ask the bigger question, are rare disease patients going to get the universal health coverage that NHI seeks to provide? And I don't want to discuss reasons to include rare diseases um, within the context of uni uh, universal healthcare um, as well as NHI, but rather to ask how we can exclude them or how we cannot include them. South Africa has been a member country of the United Nations since 1945, and as such, we are bound by the SDGs, of which goal three includes the following targets, and that's to achieve universal health coverage, including financial risk protection, access to quality essential healthcare services, um, as well as to strengthen the capacity, as well as a reduction of the under five mortality rate, as Dr. Malherba was just indicating. 
essential by very definition refers to something being of absolute necessity or extreme importance. Approved rare disease treatments are proven to be the safe, effective and of good quality and benefits must always be set on the basis of evidence-based medicine and clinical appropriateness. In South Africa, we know that we have robust laws, including Section 27 of our Constitution, which states unequivocally that access to healthcare is a basic human right, and not recognizing the vulnerable community that is or impacted by rare diseases is essentially a violation of this fundamental right. The innate characteristic of rare diseases often pose an ethical consideration, and I can imagine that this is one of the difficulties in trying to determine how you can use, get the most bang for your buck, essentially, when it comes to budgetary constraints. And that question, and we get posed this question often as advocates for rare disease patients, and that is why invest the cost of treating 100 HIV patients when the same costs can treat only one rare disease patient. But social justice refers to where there is a fair distribution of benefits and burdens in society. And not treating the rare disease patient undoubtedly poses a burden to society. When looking at the concept of social justice, there are four principles that need to be considered, and that is access, equity, rights, and participation, all of which have a positive outcome in the event that the rare disease patient is treated. So the concept of progressive realization is widely accepted an interpretation of economic, social, and cultural rights. And it has also been implied in the African Health Charter in accordance with Article 61 and 62. Um, South Africa are therefore under a continuing duty and obligation to move as expeditiously and effectively as possible towards the full realization of economic, social, and cultural rights. And the progressive realization obligation is therefore not completely eliminated due to resource constraints, because resource constraints alone cannot justify inaction. And therefore, to achieve health equity in South Africa, we need to ask ourselves the pertinent question. How can we claim to have achieved universal health care or health equity for all when we knowingly exclude marginalized and vulnerable patients like those impacted by rare disease, ultimately leaving them behind? So with that said, we trust that the submission will be helpful to the committee in its deliberations on the bill. We thank you for the opportunity to present our current objections, as well as our concerns on behalf of all the South Africans impacted by rare diseases currently and those to come after us. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> maybe you also want the committee to allay your fears. I, I, I acknowledge that we are struggling to satisfy with the burden of disease and the challenges we face. We are not doing well in terms of looking after some of the patients with the rare disease. But I don't think there's an impression that uh, in, the, in the current, in the next arrangement that is proposed, you will completely abandon that. You probably will struggle the same way or even improve. So that maybe one could actually say there's nowhere where there's a reference to say you completely not have this as part of look we might still be showing these gaps of a few uh, geneticists and also a few of the genetic counselors here and there but to say this service will be completely be gone and not be part of the new dispensation may not be uh, completely accurate but let me then ask the members who also have questions to ask you clarity seeking questions in the following order. Those who have indicated their desire to ask are the following. <clears throat> Number one, the Honorable Sokacha will be followed by Honorable Kela. Number three will be Honorable Munyai. No, no, no. Munyai is number four, sorry. <laughs> My handwriting here. The third one is Mama Ushengwa, and Honorable Munyai is number four. Any other members? Uh, Dr. Harvard, I will take you as number five. Jacobs, chair. Sure. Dr. Jacobs, you'll be number six. Okay, any other member? Okay, we'll go with those six hands, starting with Honorable Sokacha, followed by Honorable <coughs> Gela. Mama Shengwa will be number three. Honorable Munya, you are number four. Dr. Harvard, you are number five. And Dr. Jacobs, number six. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Let me welcome the presentation. 
Chair, just one question from my side. Uh, I've listened quite uh, attentively to the presentation. In the presentation, Chair, uh, the presenter uh, have said that uh, they are in discussion with the department on policies on rare disease. What bottlenecks have they identified in their engagement and what are they are advocating for with this portfolio committee? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Let me also welcome the presentation. I also have one question. You have indicated in your presentation that rare disease has a membership a base of 5,000. You have also indicated that at a global level, there are over 7,000 diagnostic uh, categories. Uh, you have also indicated that uh, South Africa has 3.7 million persons uh, impacted by rare disease. Uh, how many diagnostic uh, categories do we have in South Africa? Uh, are there organized uh, professional and clinical associations that have developed uh, guidelines and protocols to manage rare disease? Uh, kindly clarify. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. And I'm sure my uh, good Honorable you are number four. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Sorry, Mr. Mnai. Thank you, Chairperson. Let me welcome the presentation. In fact, it was an eye opener. We need more time with this presentation. But nevertheless, I have a few seeking clarity questions. What is the annual cost of providing medical care to patients with rare disease in South Africa? What is your suggestion in this problem in order to come across to involve NHI? in this pandemic disease? And what is the cause of this order while still young? Is there any prevention of this disease? Thank you. Yes, now it's Honorable Munai. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. Sorry, Baba. The, the, the rare disease presentation appears to be interested in specific rare disease. For example, uh, congenital disease, as opposed to paying attention to all the other diseases that fall in this broad spectrum or category of rare diseases. Uh, is this group suggesting that under NHI, certain red disease must be prioritized, not others. The other one, Honorable Chair, uh, without any waste of time, um, I would want to know that um, um, what, is, what is the reach of your organization to save this rural and the poor? And, uh, and um, and in uh, an uninsured uh, population. I mean, those broader population that has need insurance. What is the coverage and access for these populations? I thought uh, that's what I need to put forward. Yeah. Thank you, Chairperson, and thank you very much to the presenters. I must say that uh, it's a very good presentation, but it also makes us mindful that every person is important to all of us, especially us as healthcare providers. So your, it, your, your, your presentation 
has just simply highlighted this to me. Uh, and the four criteria which you mentioned, which are extremely important of access, rights, equity, and fair outcome. Certainly that should be applicable for every person uh, anywhere in the world, and especially in our democratic country. And then your second one was the full uh, realization of economic and social rights of every person. So I, I really take that, uh, take cognizance of that. So in terms of, of your presentation, I actually really like your, your contributions which you've made. And uh, the fact that you state that we are not really tackling rare diseases and congenital diseases, uh, which, which uh, contribute quite significantly to our under five mortality and our infant mortality rate. Uh, but that being as it is, uh, what I am concerned about is that it seems that you're saying that the NHI bill is destined to exclude rare diseases from the package of services. Now, uh, I'm not aware that it is mentioned anywhere in the bill. And my question is whether you are basing this upon any current experiences of patients who suffer rare diseases or the presentation seeks to, or whether your presentation seeks to highlight challenges faced by people suffering from rare diseases. Um, <clears throat> what is your proposal uh, to this portfolio committee to acknowledge the plight faced by those who fall uh, in this group of patients? Thank you very much, Chair. I apologize, uh, Dr. Harvard. <laughs> I was still preparing my questions. I did not notice that Dr. Jacobs jumped you. Uh, apologies then, uh, you come now, Dr. Hubbard. Oh, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, actually, my questions uh, uh, asked already, and let me re-ask re again. Mm, only one, what is the reach of your organization to service rural and the poor and the uninsured populations. What is the coverage and the access for these populations? Thank you, Chair. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, honorable members. And let me just also add my two on this uh, list. Uh, you are, I don't know whether you are suggesting or maybe uh, that's where you are going, that you are making a statement that suggests that there's a need for ring fencing of the funding for the management of rare diseases. Now, do you have uh, any experience internationally where some countries have actually gone this way of within their universal health coverage, uh, cater for or further on ring fence within that package uh, the, the fund that would be for management of rare diseases. Now, number two, some of these challenges that we are raising here uh, are daily occurrence. They are now today, yesterday, uh, the issues like to use an example of um, uh, primary diabetes, uh, which is, you are saying, both congenital and also a rare disease. And uh, obviously that will need uh, the support of a dietitian and also counselors. Some of these rare diseases may need uh, assisted devices. Now, we are just saying some of the things that are here happening may not have to wait for NHI to be implemented, uh, are issues that should be attended to going forward as part of the health systems for the citizens. Have you engaged any other? A sector, maybe Department of Health or any other advocating for uh, people who are advocating for maybe people with disabilities, working with them, advocating for services that are earmarked for this uh, group of uh, citizens? Or is this the first time you are uh, engaging with us? Because largely we do oversight more than being provisions for services. Uh, it would be it would be interesting to note if you have had any uh, discussions with those who are potentially able to provide services or extend or expand the service 
of such a, a group of South Africans on rare disease. Uh, maybe you can then assist us with the responses to these questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very, very much. Um, so I'm going to have taken some, some notes here, I've scribbled them down, so please bear with me if I've left anything out and if any clarity is needed, please just ask. But with regards to the first um, the first honourable speaker who asked the question, um, again, I didn't catch the surname, but the first name I think was Muxulisa. Um, discussion with regards to the National Department of Health and what are the bottlenecks and um, with regards to um, our work with national departments. So absolutely, we have been in discussion, like Dr. Malherba said, we've, we've put up our hands, we've got involved with regards to rewriting of existing guidelines and protocols, and we're always available to assist, and we do try to advocate to the best of our ability. However, uh, from a national department perspective, there seems to be a lack of urgency with regards specifically to rare diseases. And I think that there is also a sense of the problem is almost too big um, and where do you even start? Um, what we have found as well is that we have good legislation in this country. The issue comes down to accountability. Our constitution, based on that alone, patients should ultimately be treated without um, a question. And the implementation of these legislations, I think, is where we're falling short. Um, if there was good accountability and uh, they were implemented correctly and um, 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 patients were able to even um, define or develop referral pathways and understand the legislation, I think that they would also be able to self-advocate a lot better. And that seems to be, um, uh, you know, one of the places that, that patients are falling short. There has, between 2001 and currently, I mean, that is a significant amount of time. Um, and we've seen through these years that very, very little has been done with regards to rare diseases in particular from a national perspective. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to provide my, um, I'm going to provide my feedback and if Dr. Malherba wants to add anything, then, then she can. Um, with regards to the question around our membership base, um, and how many diseases we as an organization um, see 600 and just under 650 prominent conditions uh, that we see have, when I say um, a large amount of patients, in the context of rare diseases, anything from five to 10 patients is considered a large amount. So there's about 650 conditions that we see occur regularly. Um, other than that, we do obviously have the outlying conditions where you will only ever identify one patient within the country. The question with regards to um, the organized guidelines and protocols, yes, absolutely. Where there is commercial treatments available, I say commercial for lack of a better word, where there's actually a molecule or a product that is available globally and that we've managed to get registered through SAPRA and brought into the country, which in itself is a significant challenge. Um, I think that there is a desire and that we definitely do have the healthcare professionals to write up those protocols. The, the problem comes in is that the, the number of users is so low that it doesn't require that it doesn't get the urgency that it's, it is necessary. And it's much easier to treat those patients almost as piecemeal on a, on a patient by patient basis than to actually take the time out to write protocols. But for things like um, some of the lysosomal storage disorders, et cetera, such as Gaucher's disease, there have actually been um, guidelines and protocols put in place. And um, that particular condition is um, funded in the state sector, but it is one of the few rare diseases that has any form of certainty when it comes to funding. Um, with regards to the annual cost of providing care, we cannot give you an answer to that because there isn't necessarily data to support it. And this is one of the primary issues is that our um, we are not being included in terms of surveillance. We know that in terms of the congenital disorders um, that we have a under reporting of approximately 98% as per paper that was published, I think in 2016. And as a result of that, we do not have the necessary data. And because the surveillance isn't in place, we also do not have the ability to track expenditure. It's also very important to remember that from an ICD perspective and a coding perspective in the private sector, you are actually needing a confirmation of diagnosis in order to be able to pull up a list and be able to associate costs. 
um, what has happened up until now is because our diagnostic services are so low, as well as the, the lack of genetic infrastructure and counseling, et cetera, those patients are simply told, look, we know you have something rare, but we haven't gotten to the bottom of what it is. And as a result of not having that confirmed diagnosis and associated ICD-10 cost, it's very, very difficult to allocate or understand the cost involved. But what we can tell you is, um, Obviously, we have worked very, very closely with Council for Medical Schemes, and we are looking at avenues um, through our rare disease access initiatives to try and alleviate that issue so that we can start getting some data together, um, even if it's just from the private sector, because the private sector is set up and has easier resources to be able to track that. But hopefully it's a starting point and we can start determining trends based on what we see there. Um, with regards to prevention of disease, I'm sure Dr. Malherba will provide further clarity on this, but absolutely, and this is why it is so critically important that genetic services are in place and also that they are well supported with regards to um, maternal care, because essentially knowledge even is so important in the genetic counselling process, how the how the child or the patient was impacted, um, how they landed up being born or uh, with that particular condition are appropriately explained. And uh, parents and family members have the opportunity then to family plan and, and necessarily take the necessary measures um, to, to assist them with family planning um, under a consented and knowledge um, based approach, as opposed to we've had patients, you know, where one family has three children all born with the same condition um, and as a result of simply not having that knowledge gap. So prevention of disease is possible, but it requires a fair amount of uh, counselling and um, input from a professional side. Then with regards to our focus, do we want to prioritise certain diseases? Absolutely not. We are asking for the inclusion of rare diseases in their entirety. However, there is this perception um, within the healthcare system that because a rare condition might not necessarily have a commercial molecule available for it, that nothing can be done. And that's essentially what we are wanting to change. We want, we know that there is always something that can be done to improve the life of a patient, whether it be improved uh, pain medication, whether it be improved counseling and mental health support, there's always something that can be done to improve the life of that patient. But what we see currently is when there is no dedicated or affirmed treatment plan, that those patients are then subsequently lost for follow up. And that's ultimately what we are trying to alleviate. What is the reach of our organization with regards to the rural areas? Very, very low, and we admit that it is very low. As an organization, how we started and how we've been implemented has um, been largely in a technological space. We're using access to digital media, um, et cetera, et cetera, to raise awareness about our organization. However, having said that, we are strengthening our relationships with tertiary hospitals um, to try and improve our uh, service delivery to this particular percentage of the population. What we do know as well, that the referral upstream to tertiary, to tertiary centers doesn't happen very often in the rural areas. And, um, and as a result of that, those patients are not appropriately identified. And that is again why genetic counseling and genetic services is so vitally important. Because even if a community healthcare worker or community nurse had the ability to simply identify that there is a problem here and know what the referral process was for those patients, already we would have an improved outcome for those patients that are simply lost to the system. And then there was um, the comments by um, Honorable Jacobs with regards to um, the current experience of patients and is this is this why we are making uh, the assumptions that we are with regards to um, rare diseases not simply being excluded in the existing bill? Yes, we haven't seen that it is specifically excluded, but we also haven't seen evidence to show that it is specifically included. And in the current healthcare system, it is not appropriate. Access to rare disease treatments and supportive care is not a certainty. Every single patient is treated on a patient by patient basis. And you can go from five kilometers from one hospital to another and have two very, very different experiences. And with almost every single condition, we are having to make specific applications with regards to the PTC, et cetera, and provincial government with regards to funding these patients. So it absolutely is. Our assumptions and assessments are based on our personal experiences up to this point. And our personal experience, unfortunately, is that um, our patients, and this is not something, and I state this 
unequivocally, it is not something that is necessarily improved in the private sector as well. The private sector decision-making ability with regards to PMBs is largely dependent on what is available in the state sector. So it's not a case of private sector gets more. Yes, they sometimes do get more in terms of services, physiotherapy, supportive care. But with regards to actually accessing treatments, life-saving treatments, the access is not any better on either side. Um, what is our proposal specifically to this committee is one is to prioritize the recognition of rare diseases within the context of NHI and to ensure its inclusion, give us give us certainty to, to the fact that they will be included. We understand we're not going to solve the world's problems you know, in one document or in one piece of legislative, but we have to start somewhere. Our second proposal is to assist assist in terms of bringing together the necessary awareness around rare conditions to ensure that we can get improved data and that we start strengthening the system with improved data, with understanding of exactly where these patients are and what their needs are. We can then start the process of what we can do to determine those things. The question came up with regards to um, the need for ring fencing. Yes, this is definitely something that we do see in the international space. Ring fencing, um, is uh, I can make the use of um, NICE, the example of NICE, which is used in the UK, where specific conditions are put upon a list, they are evaluated based on value, and then they are placed on a list. And if you have a condition where that particular product is necessary, it comes from a specific budget. That would be an ideal scenario, a risk equalization fund where we saw e equal access regardless of what service setting you were um, being received, you know, being treated in would also be an ideal scenario. However, we need to have a definition in place before we can implement that. We cannot say this is a box of funding without understanding who's going to benefit from that box. And the problem at the moment is without a defined definition that is legislated, there will be no way for us to determine who and what. And then the next question comes in, what services would be included? Is it simply for molecules and drugs? Or would it include everything from diagnostic support to supportive care? Because that would obviously change the budget that is required significantly. So yes, we are, we would like to see a situation where there was a set budget and a set committee to evaluate entry and exit criteria for patients with regards to access certainty to allow some form of certainty for patients um, in terms of in terms of accessibility. And then with regards to the multisystemic care, this is definitely something, yes, it, on average, a rare disease patient has about six to seven doctors, and that's on average. It is a very, very multidisciplinary approach, which is why it is so important for us to have the improved referral systems in place. And like I said earlier, unfortunately, the current, the current theme is that if there's no treatment, if there's no defined treatment available to you, then there is nothing that can be done for that patient, which makes it really difficult. And once again, you need to understand what a patient has in order to be able to treat them appropriately. And our current diagnostics and genetic services do not support that. So we need to improve diagnostics. And that would be one of the fundamental things as a starting point that we would like this bill to, to bring into consideration to ensure that we start accounting for these patients somewhere. I'm going to now hand over to my colleague, Helen, to see if there's anything that she would like to add further. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Honourable Chair. I just have a few points of um, addition just to make to those. With regards to definitions um, around rare diseases and congenital disorders, just to emphasize that 80% um, of rare diseases are essentially congenital disorders because they are genetic. That means that a child is born with an abnormality in structure or function that is present from birth. Um, and that is the clarification just to, to, for that point. Um, with regards to um, prevention um, from an honorable member, um, I would just like to outline that in genetic services, you have primary care, which is basically preventing an affected pregnancy. You have secondary prevention, which is the prevention of affected births. And then you have tertiary or um, care, um, tertiary prevention or care, which is the um, early diagnosis and intervention for affected births. So obviously, while we do want to um, prevent affected births, we have to care for those that are born affected. And um, there is a very famous quote that says, care is an absolute and prevention is the ideal. We cannot ignore those that we have 
already that are affected with rare diseases and congenital disorders uh, um, by focusing solely on prevention. With regards to prevention, we do have the issue of um, obviously if there is prenatal diagnosis available, which is very limited in South Africa, um, and we also do not have newborn screening available in the state sector at all, whereas in other countries they do screen 50 or 60 um, conditions at birth and that significantly helps reduce the burden of disease. Um, but in South Africa, we have an issue with antenatal care. While we have increased the number of first antenatal care visits, and we still have about 30% that are occurring after 20 weeks gestation. And also those that are actually accessing um, scans and ultrasonographers um, for scans, they're not having, we don't have enough skilled ultrasonographers to actually provide the in-depth um, and high resolution scans that are required. Um, to actually identify early on rare diseases and congenital disorders in pregnancy, which then leaves it late for the option of termination of pregnancy. Um, and that's a whole other issue there. Um, but I do want to highlight that the one preventative method that we have in South Africa as a prenatal, um, a preconception um, prevention mechanism is that since we have been implementing fortification of folate um, in our staple crops, it became law um, in the 2000s, we have seen a 30% drop in neural tube defects. And I think that shows such a significant impact um, for a wild, widespread preventative method um, and application that we, we need to look at these other opportunities throughout primary, secondary and tertiary prevention to actually see a further significant drop in affected births. Thank you. So you, you think you have covered all the questions that were asked? Um, Honourable Chair, just one further point um, with regards to the costing um, of what does it cost to treat a rare disease patient. As my colleague Kelly indicated, we don't know because the issue that we have at the moment is we have a lot of patients that aren't being diagnosed, so we don't know what care is required. And so we have been focusing on quantifying the burden of disease and the next step would be to cost specific components and that is a huge job and it will take significant time to do um, but it is underway and we are learning from experts around the world to do that um, but our cry is that rare disease patients have to be cared for um, and they cannot be forgotten thank you Honourable members, that was the presentation and the answers, responses to our questions. I uh, would like to thank this session that was also educational, rare diseases. But I want to say you remain advocates for such a, a program in the country. We will wish that you engage more than just us. Uh, you, we hear that there is a reluctance in the sometimes not getting proper responses. Sometimes when a person is not aware what you are dealing with, you need to continue knocking at their door regarding what you think is critical and important. Because it may as well be not taken care of seriously. We note that uh, even when you look into the health sector, the, the mental health sector is not being taken care of seriously. So you also would find such disabilities, rare diseases not being uh, the primary cause. Uh, people think they're not often there and therefore people <clears throat> will concentrate on the, off, on the rare, on the more common things. I was not aware when you talk about that if you can put all people with rare diseases, they'll be the biggest, they'll be the third biggest country in the world uh, if you were to do it that way. So it just shows how significant it is and yet they need to be supported too. Thank you for your education. We will engage with your presentation. It has been a high and opener for us, eye opener. And uh, we will also consider it as we finalize our uh, NHI bill processing. Uh, if maybe there are a few comments from your side, last closing comments. Just to say thank you very, very much for the opportunity. And um, as Rare Diseases South Africa, we look forward to a health system that services all patients regardless of, of where they're accessing services and where pricing is not the hinge point in terms of access. So we look forward to that. Okay, thank you very much. We will then allow you to leave.
Uh, maybe honorable members just stay behind for just half a minute uh, for something that I needed to raise with you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, honorable members, we need to continue thanking you for such a hard work. Uh, you were juggling between your constituency work and this uh, forecast that we have done. You have really done very well. And uh, before yesterday and today, you have done 70 uh, hearings here in this platform. And therefore, it is today more than that. Uh, we are bringing this to a, a pause, as we indicated. Uh, until we are back in Parliament uh, next in the next two weeks. However, we might have to go back to long days again. Uh, you see that we probably if we cover five and then the next day we cover four, another five, we are able to deal with the 10. So we are close to be finishing this process. We need to finish this process and therefore start uh, uh, combining this report with the report of the public hearings and look into those other 64 documents that are being processed in parliament. Uh, what might happen, honorable members, even though we have a pause, I might indulge you for a portfolio committee to update you on the processing of those 64,000 that are taking place. Uh, I did receive a report last week and therefore uh, I want them just to update it and refine it. We might have to have a portfolio committee just to listen to that progress on that. Uh, oh, there was something also interesting yesterday regarding the pharmaceuticals and APIs and the pharma when are we starting the pharmaceuticals in the country. You know that the Department of Health, the one that we are overseeing, would be a client of such a process, uh, but it can also advocate for sister departments like Department of uh, Trade and Industry uh, and Department of Science and Technology to look into those processes. So Honorable Munai was actually talking to me regarding whether we could not have such a portfolio committee. I have not uh, uh, seen uh, that uh, motivation, but maybe those are some of the things that we might call you for, uh, short meetings just to listen and then take it forward. So with those words, honorable members, once more, thank you very much for such a hard work over the past two months, processing so many hearings that came to us and your active participation is noted. We'll bring this meeting to a close. Maybe next week there might be a short meeting if what I'm saying takes place, but not as these long meetings that we have had there. Uh, have a good evening. Sorry, sorry Chairperson. Yes, Ms. Kwahobe. Thanks, Chairperson. And uh, I, I, you know, I, yeah, I welcome the, the 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 pause from the from this process. I I do think, Chair, that there are a number of quite urgent things that we, as a portfolio committee, also need to um, uh, concern ourselves with. One of the things is the engagement that we had wanted to have with the SIU regarding the Digital Vibes report. And so, Chair, I would like to table that as a as a as a as a um, as a proposal that it's something that we probably need to 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 fill in quite quickly. Um, so, yeah, if you can just perhaps between you and the secretary look at when we can have that institution in, because a lot of the questions that we had were not answered because that report wasn't that investigation was not done. Um, and as we know, it's now been about three weeks since its completion. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you. I do have a meeting with the uh, House Chair this afternoon uh, on that. Uh, I saw <laughs> you uh, calling for that, but I just need to find a way of uh, getting a guidance in the leadership. Because in any event, the SIU report was um, a report commissioned by the President. Uh, therefore, I need to check and find out if uh, that report uh, could find its way to us before the president completes his uh, 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 look into it. Uh, but I will come back to you on that because I also need that support and guidance from the house chair. Thanks. Okay, honorable members, the meeting is at the end. Thank you very much. Thank you, chair. Thank you, chair. Thank you, chair. Thank you, chair. Thank you, chair.
Yabonga, then. Masengwa. Thank you, cheers. Oh, Maken. Ipis Yabonga, Dinangwe. Yabonga, Tadjetu, Anapela. Yabonga.